Yes. Okay, cool. So uh, do we have people online saying they can hear us and we're, we're all coming through clear? Um, so uh, prefabricated buildings, prefabulous buildings, as we like to call them, um, actually have become quite popular. So uh, at least they've become popular in the uh, conversations about architecture and building, if not actually in the marketplace. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. So um, the description that you signed up for on this course and the whatever the people online signed up for is this right here um, about prefab systems are claimed to be cheaper, faster, more energy efficient, less wasteful. Uh, they slice, they dice, they make puppies cuter. Uh, that, that's basically everything's great about them. But uh, when it comes down to the actual uh, practical world of building building systems and uh, building components, there's a lot of challenges to making prefab work to its potential. So that's why we're going to talk a little bit about panels, talk about modules, uh, talk about prefab in general, and then talk about how this may change uh, how you have to design and construct buildings and how you can screw things up, and how you can get to the high performance, which is the opposite of screwing things up. So um, I've titled this is Prefab the Future again, and I'm first going to start a little bit of a historical review of prefab in the past, because we've been through cycles of prefab is the future, prefab is going to solve all of our building problems, on a one or two generation cycle. Usually it's about 30 years, it seems. Uh, every 30 years it comes up as it's the new, it's the answer for all of our problems. So why prefab? Well, it, you know, it offers the potential to be cheaper, faster, greener, um, better quality, uh, less time on site, less sensitivity to weather. Um, and all of those things can be true and all of those things can be false. There is no implicit reason why prefab will, will deliver on any of these without it being a design objective. But by that same token, many uh, on-site construction techniques could be cheaper, faster, better quality, and greener if you design them as well. Uh, but prefab, there's good reasons why prefab is becoming more of a real thing uh, it doesn't quite keep up with the hype, but it's a real thing. Um, often we, you know, the one thing I hear over and over again, you know, it just clicks together like Lego, uh, which if I hear it one more time, I'm going to be physically ill because it, Lego doesn't come in 8,000 pound cubes uh, that are 38 feet long and are installed with cranes, come alongs and curse words. Um, so th it really, there are no systems that click together like Lego because we're dealing with large components that need to be large, need to be heavy because buildings are large and heavy. And so those are, so it, it makes it too simple and it makes people not focus on what needs to be solved in design. If you make it sound like, oh, it just all clicks together like Lego. Um, so one of the things that we've learned about prefabricated buildings, and maybe I should mention a little bit about my uh, work is that I, I work generally in, in buildings, but uh, I've had a number of uh, uh, projects in prefab over the years, over the last 20 years even. Uh, we've worked quite a bit with um, uh, projects in the last 10 years as they become more common. Uh, one of the case studies we'll discuss at the end of the session today is a Oakland, California, 10-year-old uh, zero net energy prefab house project. Uh, but, you know, we're, I'm working on uh, prefabricated modular projects right now. Uh, and so this is embodying some of the knowledge that and experience that we've gained from that. And one of those things is that um, it, uh, prefabrication almost always reduces time on site, uh, both labor hours on site and calendar hours on site. Almost by definition, you're building it off site. However, it doesn't always, and in fact, it doesn't often reduce project time. From the time that the uh, owner says, I have a site and I think I know I need a building on it, to occupancy um, may not be much faster because it does take more upfront design time to get prefab systems. You have to design more. You have to be more careful during the design time. 
to get up to speed uh, to make sure because you don't have the ability to adapt on the job site. So you have to do more design up front. And uh, so it is definitely faster on the job site, which is good. Um, but you also can't underrate, underrate the amount of time it takes to design the project in the office and do mock-ups and sentiment. I say here the future is almost certainly more prefab. And one of the reasons I say that is that we have a 100-year track record, at least, of more and more prefab in the building industry. It's just that people don't like to acknowledge that things like pre-made windows are prefab uh, or kitchen cabinetry is prefab or furnaces are prefab. It used to be all those things were built by components brought to the site. They would assemble a boiler out of pi uh, the, the pipes and the pumps and the, the chutes for the coal, and they put it all together on the job site, and they made a coal-fired boiler. Uh, well, today, we would never do that, right? We would prefab that. Windows, until the Second World War, were routinely built on site. Uh, stairs, even after the Second World War in single-family homes, were routinely built on site. Um, and over time, we have turned those into quote-unquote mass-produced, but they're actually mass customization because, for example, stairs, there's not that many that are exactly the same. And we have been doing mass customization in housing for things like stairs for at least 25 years. And everybody measures out what they have for their house and you get a custom stair made for it, although it's done with mass production techniques using standard attack pieces. So we've been doing that, but let's look at those things that we do in single family homes uh, as uh, a common prefabrication. I mentioned kitchen cabinets, furnaces, uh, stairs, windows and doors. There's a good reason why those were chosen to be prefabricated in the past. They are high value, low volume and low weight items. So dollars per cubic foot, dollars per uh, uh, pound, those are high value. And so it's worth putting in the effort to prefabricate them. Walls, which is the place where we're, you know, we're moving towards trying to say, let's re prefabricate the walls of our houses. They're actually relatively low value. A wood stud wall filled with fiberglass with gypsum on, on the outs, inside and oil is be on the outside. It's not a lot of dollars per pound or per cubic foot. Now, as labor rates go up, more and more, quote unquote, lower value components of the building will be prefabbed. And when we look at the, the trend lines, that's why I'm saying I'm certain we'll see more prefab in the future as we continue to prefabricate more and more pieces of our buildings. Now, I'm, I mentioned houses. Well, we can t bring the same discussion. Millwork is, is built in factories and brought to office buildings, uh, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of the value, dollar value of buildings in the commercial sector and residential sector is not created on the job site. It already is assembled. So what the current trend of people talking about prefab is, is mostly about moving down the value chain and saying things that are less dollars, like walls, like roofs, like floors, are also going to be prefabricated. And that's really what we're hoping for. Now, the public imagination, not involved in the building industry, tends to think of prefab as a completely finished office, hospital, or house being, you know, uh, plopped off a truck and onto the job site. That's a long way from here. There's a lot of challenges to making that happen. Although we have examples with constraints, we have examples where that can happen, which I will, I will show you. Um, so I'd mentioned these, uh, the, the previous history of some prefab, but also let's talk about the types of prefab. Um, I call panel systems flat pack. It's sort of like Ikea. Uh, a long time ago realized that shipping air around the countryside was pretty expensive. And remember, buildings are mostly air, right? In fact, that's what their purpose is, is to provide enclosed space of a desirable quality, right? And so that's part of the challenge as a product is that they're shipping big volumes with nothing in it. Well, so furniture can be like that. And so what IKEA's solution was is to flat pack it. The building industry's solution was let's make panelized systems, panelized precast, panelized steel stud, panelized wood stud. Um, that is panel and uh, systems. 
When you go the next level up, we end up with volumetric or modular construction, which means that we actually do ship air. And the, the big change between panels and modules is that to make it worth shipping all that air in a, in a volumetric uh, pre prefab, you need to actually put more finishes on the inside to justify the shipping of the air. And that creates some issues uh, in that you have to uh, protect those finishes from the weather during uh, transportation. Now, let's go back really into history a bit. Uh, this is a fairly famous building in, 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 in circles that care about prefab. This is the Crystal Palace made for the World Exhibition in London, England in 1851 by, a name by, uh, by an architect. By the, well, he wasn't an architect, actually, by a gardener by the name of Paxton. And uh, he was a gardener who was a pretty hands-on dude by the sounds of it. Um, and he won this competition uh, to make, a, in a short time, a huge area for the exhibition. And what he did is he used recently developed, for you know, 1840s developed, greenhouse technology. Um, and they used the largest avail massly available glass, which was 10 by 49 inches. It had to do with how big the rolling bed was, because this was back in the day when they rolled glass by hand. Um, and so anyways, 10 by 49 inch uh, glass piece, standardized components of cast iron and trusses, and they, uh, and like all good successful prefab, he was, uh, he stuck to his guns about the modules. He didn't change shapes. They didn't have a curved section. They didn't have parts of the building enclosure that were opaque and others that were transparent. No, everything is the same and you fit the building use to the building that I can make. And that allowed them to crank out a thousand cast iron trusses that are the same with no variations. All the glass sheets with few exceptions were all the same. And that's part of how you get the benefit of prefab is constraining the architectural design to be more repeatable uh, so that you can get the benefits of economies of scale. Um, and so, and the, the definitely Crystal Palace did that. They did that in a way that was rather remarkable to the people at the time. And even today, it kind of looks kind of neat. Um, so let's, let's move forward a bit uh, and, and jump the pond over to America. Um, and the, another successful uh, prefabrication endeavor uh, were the pre-cut uh, panel houses uh, like Sears Roebuck, Sears Roebuck uh, catalog houses. The Sears Roebuck one on the right, you would literally get a catalog with a range of houses and you would, by telegram, uh, make an order to Sears Company and they would deliver an entire pre-cut house to the nearest railway station. And that pre-cut house included the flooring, the windows, the glass, the nails, all of the sheathing and studs were cut to the right length and labeled. And, and then you could use semi-skilled labor. Uh, you still had to know which end of the hammer was. But there were at least a dozen other manufacturers that are knowing what we know delivered more than a thousand houses. I think, uh, the Sears Roebuck house was uh, in the, uh, uh, the, the yeah, 70,000 homes. Sears Roebuck is 70,000 homes. And if you add the other manufacturers, it, it would more than double, which if you think about 1920 America, that was a serious amount of the houses that were delivered in that time period. This was responding to the need that exhibited, particularly in the Midwest and emerging areas of New England, where they had a lot of need for housing, but they didn't have trained, skilled people to do it. Um, and because you couldn't just find a local builder who could do this at any affordable cost, that was the niche these prefabricated, pre-cut house systems were filling. And that worked out rather well. Uh, although they started, uh, the uh, end was nigh by, as the uh, depression arrived, partly because of the depression. Um, there wasn't as many people who wanted to spend money on houses, um, and we also see, saw less growth. So we, we were able, the local forces were easily able to come up, keep up with the demand for new houses. And so it's not clear exactly why uh, people have looked at this 
why these pre cut systems went away, but by 19, but by the Second World War, they were pretty much uh, no longer building a significant number of houses in America. And by the end of the Second World War, there's almost nothing left. So, and, I, and it's also interesting, this is a catalog I have from Bennett's, which is based in Buffalo, New York, which is near to where I live. And it says, how science solved the high cost of home building. And uh, science's answer is the Bennett way. And literally, the lingo being used, I know they're not using the word, we're going to disrupt the housing industry, because that is a new language being used. But it's basically saying the same thing, right? It's like, you folks, you're all idiots. We figured this out. We're going to apply rational engineering and industrial processes to provide housing. And, you know, for sure, no one's going to be building houses on site anymore. And, and that's what they were saying 100 years ago. Uh, they were wrong 100 years ago. <laughs> And so that should give people a little bit of pause about thinking how easy this problem is to solve uh, if they weren't able to do it with a lot of, uh, this is only another try, try. Okay, let's fast forward, jump back over the Atlantic, post Second World War, although some of this affected America as well. Um, Post-war Britain has the best example. There was a tremendous need for housing. Uh, a couple reasons that they needed housing. One, the Germans had destroyed a lot. Uh, two, they had promised servicemen uh, loans and housing exactly as they did in America. Um, and so there was a need to rebuild a lot of housing quickly. At the same time, they had just come off of, remember the, the British had a war that was about six years long, uh, not a four-year war that America had. They had been spending six years building like stink ships, airplanes, tanks, etc., and so they're going, well, now we need houses. We don't need tanks. We don't need airplanes. Why don't we just take the same production technology that we've already built up and successfully deployed for tanks and airplanes and deploy it for housing? That's what they also thought in America, right? Um, and so a lot of the solutions that were developed were along the lines of factory production, often metal, sometimes aluminum, particularly in America, um, where they would say, hey, let's just do what the, and that's what they tried. And these were much less successful than they were, uh, were, the, were the kit houses as a percentage of the market. Although in Britain, they were the most successful. This is where they had the biggest influence. Although, uh, interesting, um, there's a, this is an aero house, it's called, uh, made by the Bristol Aeroplane Company, right? So just, you know, we used to make planes, now we make houses. Um, and uh, some of these systems, uh, the ones that were more successful, actually the ones were based on concrete because people were used to having walls that you could hit without putting your fist through. Uh, and uh, they, the, but there was a whole bunch of variations and these are now cataloged. Some of them are on the historical register because they reflected a time. But very quickly, uh, by the time, again, by the time that site builders were able to keep up with demand uh, and people could afford better, they bought them. They bought better. Uh, they wanted, believe it or not, back then, people wanted houses with individual character and maybe individual shapes that matched their local area, the actual site they were on. I know today people want to buy exactly the same house everywhere, but back then, uh, one of the challenges facing prefab was that people, and it was more then, meaning somebody in York there's a completely different way of a house, what it's supposed to look and, and finish and feel than if you go to Dorset. And so that was a major, uh, when you were desperate for housing, you didn't mind having a square box that looked like a barracks. But as soon as you could afford better or more adjusted to your aesthetic and practical needs, you chose it. And that's when the prefab started to fall off the marketplace. Uh, they were cheaper but they were too much a repetitive box made in a factory because they were a repetitive box made in a factory. So uh, another example of post-war took longer in the, the, the communist bloc, uh, in the Soviet Union, in, in Poland, etc., because they actually had even more damage done to their physical infrastructure and their economy. Um, and they really meant that they wanted to do something. And as a socialist, communist countries, they were saying, we're actually going to try really hard to, instead of build tanks, build houses. Now, uh, one of, it, it, 
Khrushchev, who became the, the premier in, in the Soviet Union, uh, was actually for a time in charge of housing in, in uh, Soviet Union, Russia mostly. And he led the design and manufacturing processes for uh, mid-rise housing. And so they called them Khrushchevs or something like that uh, after him. Um, and, you know, this is just a picture, uh, a photograph of what they looked like. And again, what made these things possible to build and meet the goals of low cost housing for many people was there's a lot of common pieces repeated over and over and over again. And it wasn't the manufacturing in either the British or the Russian case that you couldn't make alter various different details. It was the ability to get efficiency on a job site of knowing that panel A always fits together with panel B in the same manner, as opposed to, well, unless it's got a brick cladding, as opposed to a stucco cladding, as opposed to a wood cladding, and then there's different. So no, we're all going to be the same, which worked very well for a socialist Russia, because we're all the same, right? Except for the people driving limos. They're all the same. Uh, <laughs> um, these things, both socially because they were able to impose this on entire cities and entire districts, we see lots of these built. And this was, from a point of view of percentage of market, the most successful manufactured prefab housing uh, enterprise in the world. It became a pretty classic social disaster, uh, and it was technically kind of dubious. They did build them inexpensively for a number of reasons. I don't think this was intrinsic in prefab. It's just that they had to build a lot of housing without a lot of resources. But the social implications of having all the buildings look alike and that apartment 302 was identical to apartment 1105 was actually turned uh, it, uh, these things into a serious social housing problem. And so um, we saw the same thing in America in the 60s with uh, social housing projects, which many of them have since been just blown up and rebuilt, uh, deemed in the 70s to be unfixable, like you just couldn't make them socially acceptable by, uh, without really dramatically changing them because people wanted independ uh, independence, they wanted uniqueness, they wanted the ability to modify their homes uh, in aesthetics and in utility. And so modern uh, prefab, it has to respond to that and, and generally is responding to that. So there was a, a couple of uh, major uh, programs, government programs in the Western world. There was the Million Homes Project in Sweden, uh, which ran through the decade of the 60s to provide housing. What was specifically important about the Million Homes Program is that the, the government put aside really tremendous amounts of money for research into how to do this and research across the board. Everything's from the soil, the, the soils across Sweden. So no one had to guess what the foundations were like all the way to psychologists and sociologists to understand what housing is appropriate for a five-year-old, a 15-year-old and an 85-year-old. They really did. And they continue that tradition today of really broad, deep, valuable research, which can help all of us. I, I look towards that stuff a lot to get ideas because they really looked at what do we mean by good housing. Um, another example was what was called Project Breakthrough in the 1970s in, uh, in America. This was when the housing and urban development uh, under, an, under, I think it was Nixon started it, uh, but it might've been Linda B. Johnson, uh, where they um, started to say, similar to what Sweden was, how do we use technology to improve our housing? And they, they sponsored a number of prefabricated housing systems. They uh, subsidized a number of uh, relatively large developments uh, across America in an attempt to kickstart uh, industrialized housing. Um, and while some, some research was done then, Mostly that program ended in a bit of a fizzle as none of the systems that were promoted were able to stand on their own without government support, even though some of them did end up building five or 700 houses uh, or apartment units without government uh, subsidies. Uh, they just didn't make sense economically. So it was a, some lessons learned, but nothing significant came of it. 
Without any government support, uh, we started to see this stuff happening in the late 70s into the late 80s, depending where you are. Um, I'm not sure what the situation was in a California area around there, but I do know that modular housing manufacturers in the Midwestern United States, um, and in these two are in Canada, uh, began to have figure out a system that was successful. I have to mention that manufactured homes was a term used for trailers or HUD code homes. I'm putting air quotes around the trailers uh, where they have a steel frame, right? They drive them to site, pull the wheels off and put them on blocks. Um, those are still, and then you people talk about double wise. That's still an industry, uh, although it's, and it is prefabricated, but it, again, it makes itself work by having very standardized and often low durability materials. Um, to be able to meet the price points and, and uh, it has a very specific market segment that it works towards. Um, so the modular homes uh, often use similar techniques as being used, wood framing, OSB, uh, shingles on the roof, stuff like that was used. Um, and uh, I think Royal Homes remains the biggest modular home manufacturer in North America. And they started in 1979, 78. Uh, Quality Homes was followed on and maybe in the mid 80s. Uh, and these are basically selling what looks to everybody like a house, not architects, but to, you know, people like normal people. Uh, so they have uh, <laughs> so they have picket fences and they have shutters that are uh, made out of plastic stuck to walls and and stuff like that. So that, that they build what people generally wanted. Um, and they, they, these were volumetric and they would break a house down into two modules if it's a single story house and, and, and maybe four modules if it's a two story house. There's still a um, often need for site building, both not just for the joints, but also for say the attached garage might not be done modularly because there's no value inside, right? So it's just a chip, just a drywalled enclosure. Um, so that's how these uh, continue to grow, uh, continue to serve a community. And modular home manufacturers exist across North America, um, and they have for a long time. One of the things they aren't is cheaper than a production built home. Uh, uh, they're not even close to the same price. They are cheaper than a custom built home. So. They fit in the niche between the two. Uh, they're usually closer to custom built home prices, but if you talk about one of the large, you know, uh, 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 Havnavian homes or Meritage homes or uh, Pulte or uh, David Weekly or whatever, these big, those people are building houses on a per square foot cost that are literally half what it costs to build modular homes. Um, so they're also using factory techniques. What they, they don't do is they don't build the house in the factory and then take the house to site. They take the factory to the site and they move the people from, uh, from one uh, site to the next because it's a lot easier to move people and chop saws than it is to move finished houses. The disadvantage, of course, is that you still get rained on. And so uh, some builders have actually literally built tents over houses uh, on, and so that they can actually totally turn off the, the, uh, the, the weather that matters, which is not temperature, it's, it's, it's rain and sun. Uh, and that's easier to move than is the finished house. <laughs> so remember, that's how it's very different than most consumer products. It's hard to move houses. Now, people say, but what about, you know, planes? What about ships? You know, they're big. They're way bigger than even most buildings. Uh, yes, but they're also products that are designed to move. That's actually what they are. So the wh whatever option you have to build an airplane, outdoors, indoors, um, the product has to be able to move. And it doesn't have to use the roads to get where it eventually ends up. Uh, airplanes use the air. Uh, ships use the water. And they're designed to move, so there's no extra cost to design uh, a airplane or ship to move from where it's built. That's completely different than buildings. They're, the buildings are not supposed to move. They're actually, you, buildings are heavy things that don't move. Airplanes are light things that do. 
Uh, and so when you build a heavy thing that's not supposed to move and then you design it to move, that incurs costs. And, that, uh, and how do we move buildings around our country? Do we fly them? No, we have to drive them on trains and, and roads. And as a consequence, your, dis, your, your scale is immediately limited. Uh, when you design an Airbus 380 and decide to have a 225-foot span or whatever the number is, big whoopee. The sky is big enough to handle it. I can take it from Toulouse, France, where I do the final assembly, and I can fly it anywhere in the world because it's meant to fly. And therefore, you end up with very different technologies and very different processes to it. Notice also that ships and planes do make sure you don't build one of them. That's how you go out of business. You build hundreds of them that are almost identical. Uh, and that's what we have a harder time doing. In the, people don't seem to mind uh, that there are 100,000 Toyota Tercels of the same model year, but they, and they don't mind that there are 150 Airbus 380s of the same model but they do mind if they have 100 of their neighbors have the same house as they do. So you have to sprinkle them around. So there's a really good and I think common sense reasons why the approaches taken by the aerospace and shipping industries doesn't work very well when it's applied to the building industry. And the big challenge of the building industry is that people want uniqueness uh, and pay a premium for it. And people want um, people don't want to spend a lot of money on a per square foot basis. Uh, destroyers and airplanes are way more expensive, and so you can spend the money it takes. So um, this didn't stop the the excitement of the '60s of trying to do prefab. Uh, this was a factory built project. You're going to make volumetric modules out of concrete. Um, the, this was a master's thesis from a guy made by the name of Moshi Soft, uh, yeah, Softy, uh, and he uh, did as uh, in, in McGill in uh, 1965, I think, entered a competition for housing for the World's Fair in 1967. Notice how we've come back from 19, 1851 Crystal Palace World Exhibition to the eight, 1967. Um, this was supposed to be cheaper, faster, and better. Um, it, mm, it was interesting, but it was neither cheaper nor faster. Uh, and so the far fewer modules were built than originally planned because each of them cost way more money than they said. And they had a really hard time because they were to get it built in time because they were behind schedule and it took a lot longer. Uh, and we'll find those stories over and over again in the industry. Outrageous claims and the reality being a little bit more challenging. So now we're talking 2008. Uh, this is in Britain. Hope you don't get too dizzy with our geographical travels here. Uh, this is a Mansur award-winning prize. It's an architectural prize. Richard Rogers is a relatively famous uh, architecture firm. One of the things that Richard Rogers is known for is uh, their technology, like they're not scared of using technology and they had some pretty famous and successful buildings where they expose the structure and the ductwork and stuff like this to be, uh, you know, very technologically focused. Um, and their challenge here was to produce prefab housing that was going to be less expensive. So mass factory produced, quote, mass factory produced housing erected in three days, incorporating top technology, top energy performance, a radical, innovative and outstanding step away from traditional mud and mess of the domestic site. Um, so now we see the language repeated, but it's only 10 years ago that they're repeating now, but I'm just the same quota language has been, this breathless excitement has been repeated for 150 years. Um, so here they are. This is some of the advertising at the time about, um, th this was a panelized system, by the way, not modular. Um, and the panels, and this is partly shipping, especially you can imagine in Britain where the roads are maybe, what, five feet wide. Uh, <laughs> If you've ever been, okay, I'm exaggerating. But um, that, so that was panelization turned out to be a better solution for them. Uh, they erected it in three days. Not really true, meaning, again, to a reporter standing on the site, it was erected in three days. It took another three months for them to run things like, say, electrical wiring, plumbing, floor finishes, 
little details like that. Um, but again, a lot of prefab focus without, if you, if you don't have a serious prefab, is that they're just looking at what's it take to get the box up, right? And they think that that's the solution, whereas in fact, the walls, maybe that's 25% of the solution. There's a lot of money in finishes and services that, you, uh, that are critical to having an effective building. And so, you know, you got to include the whole package if you want to really solve the problem that they're claiming to solve. Of course, um, uh, there's a you know, not so happy end to this particular story, uh, as there are too many of these prefab stories. Uh, the the Khrushchevskis uh, were famous for being really cold and leaking at the joints. And many of them are being demolished because they are falling apart. Um, the Habitat 67 has, that I showed you with all the modular concrete, leaky, uh, lots of problems at joints and flower pots and so on. Um, and here we have the 2008 version. Here we have, it's 2014, so it made it to six years before it hit the newspaper. Um, and uh, there were widespread leaks, rot, mold, cracked drywall, etc. And all of these things shared in common the challenge that uh, joints are a, a, always a part of life in prefabrication. At the very least, you have a joint between the, the module and the foundation, but many times you have joints of module to module, and when you do panelized systems, you've got joints between each of the panels. And every time you have a joint, you have the potential for a hole between the inside and the outside. And for those of you who attended the morning session, we learned that holes are where leaks occur. Uh, and so these joints need a lot of uh, attention. And so yeah, that's part of the thing about designing from the beginning. Um, totally doable. It just requires respect that this is a problem worth solving and investigating. How are we going to do this? So um, here's a, a, a 2012. While the Oxley Park ones were beginning to rot in New York City, uh, a couple of people who are... I would argue, as experienced and as capable as you can think of, Skanska Construction, uh, multi-billion dollar, one of the largest building man, uh, builders in the world, uh, Forest City Radnor, the largest real estate firm in the New York City area, and Shop Architects, pretty well-known architecture firm, joined forces to build the world's largest modular prefabricated towel tower. Uh, I'm just giving you a, uh, Lloyd Alter is a, uh, on, I don't know if people know the website, Tree Hugger. Um, it's, it's definitely worth reading and he's a great architectural uh, uh, commentator and critic and an architect. Um, anyway, he goes, uh, uh, we'll be built at and I eat my words. Meaning a year ago he said, it ain't going to happen. I know too much about prefab. There's no way they're going to build a prefab tower in a year. Well, uh, this is what they said, right? We're going to build this tower. And they said, it'll be the world's tallest modular. We cracked the code. Now, this is language that's getting closer to Silicon Valley, right? Talking about this way. They didn't quite use the word disruptive yet, but they cracked the code. Um, up to 25% cheaper half the time. Same claims we've heard in 1920 from the Bennett Homes pre-cut housing company. Um, well, here we are next year. Now, we didn't have to wait six years for this one. They're not even past the sixth floor before uh, there are serious problems. Uh, and actually, it was the sixth floor where the construction came grinding to a halt. Uh, they thought they'd come up with a fix. They started going again, and then they stopped again, I think, at the 10th or 12th floor. Uh, and it sat there for another year as they tried to figure out the problems. Um, and so here's some quotes from uh, various, this is uh, different articles, different locations online. Half of the first 39 apartments suffered significant water damage. The first floor floors were largely gutted. So what they discovered is that when you do modular, that you put drywall and, uh, and uh, millwork in, um, when you install it, you have to have it completely waterproof. And, of course, the design was, well, we, they waterproofed the walls, but they didn't waterproof the ceiling because, of course, there's going to be another module put on top. Um, and so, um, you know, a temporary roof. Well, that's not going to work. Well, they didn't take that seriously enough. They also, they built this out of steel. Why? Because steel can be made to precise tolerances. Well, yes and no. 
<laughs> um, so steel can be made to reasonably precise tolerances, but large objects have a percentage variation even by just temperature. So I'll show you an example. We had a, a project of a 48 foot long steel module and it's built in China uh, and it's being shipped to the northern part of Canada. Well, when the temperature goes from the construction welded, you know, right to the nearest fraction of an inch at 80 degrees, and then you, 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 you set it on the site at 20 degrees, it shrinks. So you can build it to exactly laser guided tolerances and you will be off by a quarter inch because it got to 20 degrees. Then you bolt it together, someone turns on the heat and it gets back up to 70 degrees. Now, this is entirely predictable and it's entirely manageable if you design it. If you don't believe your magic, if you say, oh, things can move. I just gave you one reason why, moisture. I mean, so temperature. Another reason could be uh, things like uh, uh, just different loading conditions. Again, modular, you, you load it. When you lift it, it bends uh, and because you're holding it onto the ends. And so we end up with sag that's quite different than when you set it into place. So you get all kinds of movements. You just have to be realistic about adjustability. And once you do that, it's quite, re it's quite practical to say, okay, and I'll add a bit of dimensional construction tolerance in there because once I have a joint that can accommodate movement, why shouldn't I accommodate it? The, the wrong thinking is I can build this so perfectly, I do not have to accommodate movement because it doesn't, it's not just about dimensional tolerances. It's also about material properties, earth settling, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is a photograph. That horizontal joint line is supposed to be like all lined up. <laughs> Uh, and you can see it's not all lined up. Uh, th this is the sixth floor. They're going to go to the 24th floor. And those dimensions tend to build up and get more out of whack all the time. Um, th this is not a manufacturing tolerance problem. It's go you're going to have these variations. You have to have ways of building in tolerance that include manufacturing tolerance and a whole bunch of others. Uh, so this is apparently where the water went in at the holes. Now, let's talk about the successful systems on the market with these cautionary tales of the littered bodies of companies and projects who said, don't worry, it's easy, it's faster, it's cheaper, it clicks together a Lego. Um, there are actually lots of prefab building systems out there that work. I'd say modular housing is one, and it's ongoing challenges to get the joints right, but it's totally easy to do. Many companies are, are, are making it work. Precast concrete is a commercial flat pack panelized system that we started doing in the 30s, uh, but really didn't get uh, quite polished until the 60s and 70s. Um, but nowadays, it's like people don't even consider it. Like, and so it, it doesn't have any sex appeal anymore because it's no risk. We absolutely know what we're doing. There's a whole bunch of manufacturers who can do this. We know what it's capable of. We know what to, what to worry about. And so well, who's going to write a newspaper article or architectural journal article about something that works and we know how to do it? Um, and so that's what precast, though, is. The innovation seems to have been more in, for a long time, we never shipped these panels with windows installed. Uh, and we would install the windows on site. Increasingly, uh, we're seeing windows installed in the panels because it means when I put that panel on that building, I have now at least stopped the rainwater from getting in and the wind blowing in. It's actually not quite true. I have to put a cock bead or a tape on the inside of the joint to keep the water from blowing in. Um, that's a big deal if you're a construction manager trying to build things on a, on a, in a hurry. Because the sooner you can weather in that floor, the sooner you can put the drywall in, start putting up mechanical electrical systems, etc. And the reason that more of this doesn't happen is entirely procedural. There's no technical reason why it doesn't make sense to put the window in a, at the factory, but the people who make precast concrete are not the people who make the windows. And so you actually have to bring those two people together. The precast people will whine that, oh, well, now I have to leave a spart of my yard separate for storage and what happens if my forklift operator drives his fork through the window you know 
How about you get a reasonable forklift operator? But I'm sure people sit and have all these excuses that precast people are used to panels that you can b- beat up and, and knock around and windows make it a more sensitive product. Um, but for, there are some manufacturers, this particular project on the right is a, is a pro, uh, in New York City, and it is a company from Quebec that's basically said, hey, this is actually people want to do this. And so they've got it figured out. They're totally jiggy with it. And they're, they're uh, well, they're very busy. You, you, can't, you can't order their product and get it in two years because their book is totally full. Because uh, anybody who wants a precast concrete panel with a window in it goes to BBDL and they get a fantastic product. Um, Richard Stern, just uh, architect, just finished a 80, 79 story tower in, in New York City with this type of window in the precast. Uh, made in Quebec. Tr- trucked almost 400 miles, lifted up by crane. People talk about weight and so on. It's nothing compared to the benefits of having a pre-made uh, enclosure that you can close in quickly. So one of the things we've learned on these multi-story buildings is that once you start getting the, the windows installed ahead of time, yep, you got to cock or tape the inside joint. You don't do it from the outside to start with. You do it from the inside because it's fast and easy. And then about every four to six floors, depending on your construction cycle, you've got to waterproof a floor. Not perfectly waterproof, but you've got to seal up every pipe riser, every stairwell, and you, then, and you turn that into a roof. And that way you can reliably start drywalling below that floor. Uh, so uh, people say, oh, I don't need to do that until it rains and then the water trickles down three floors and you have to rip out a drywall ceiling. So it's really cheap to put the waterproofing, and basically it depends on the construction cycle, what you're looking for. Uh, But it's completely doable and been done to be able to have concrete pouring on the 32nd floor while we're we're actually sanding drywall on the 16th floor. Uh, And so which means that you top out at floor 48 and you're move-in ready on floor 8. Uh, so that's the possibilities, um, and I'm showing particularly two different types. The one on the right has a brick look. Well, it's not a brick look. It's actually brick, thin slips of brick. You're looking the concrete's the backside to show the window clips, or and this one looks like stone. It isn't stone. It just looks like stone. Um, you can get more modernist renditions of this stuff. Um, this is a project that RDH did in in Vancouver. And uh, part of the, t- the, the target here was that the client said uh, they don't want to spend more than $50 a square foot on their facade. It was a little less than that, actually. Um, and so they would either do window wall or something else. And so this was what we came up with as something else because it's way better than window wall. Uh, and, that, and they were totally keen. They said, yeah, we'd love to have something that has better solar and thermal, but I, I don't want to spend more than 50 bucks, and I have to get it installed quickly. And so this was a three-day per floor cycle. Uh, Yeah, so every three days uh, up goes another uh, row row of those um, walls. It it really uh, is easy to do. So uh, this is an example here uh, of a panelized uh, precast. This is a New York City job um, where the panel is being swung into place. um, And you can get pretty good square footages done. The reason this picture is done at night is that with panelized uh, or prefab construction, you actually are more dependent on the crane to get the pro- – it's the only way to lift it up. And the crane, of course, is the most critical item on a construction site. Uh, that's what defines the speed of construction of your high-rise building because how quickly you can get stuff up. Now, we've offloaded all the concrete to pumps to open up more crane time, but as we want to accelerate more – We've offloaded panelization, the enclosure on the outside to the nighttime. So you build the building from, you know, crane operators there usually before 6 a.m., but the real shift starts 7 to 3. And then uh, either uh, you're doing the 3 to 11 shift with panels if you're not too much of a hurry. And if you're really in a hurry, you're doing the 11 to 7 shift on installing panels in the middle of the night. Um, totally doable. Uh, it's just that, again, it points out you've got to plan your crane time with your construction manager on large projects to be able to uh, take full advantage of the speed that this offers. 
the technical, there's a couple technical innovations that are required to make precast a successful system and has a track record as a successful system. Uh, innovation number one is that you have adjustable connections. Uh, totally acknowledge that not only is the panel not going to be built within one eighth inch tolerances, but the building is probably not built within one inch tolerances. The only place where you get totally level floor slabs is in Revit. Uh, in real life, you're going to get variations in height, you're gonna get variations in and out, and those variations are in the order of an inch, and that's actually a reasonably tight spec. If you have uh, a 200 foot long slab on a building, there's almost no hope of it being within the grid line of an inch. Uh, it has to do with reality, et cetera. Um, and so one can try and reduce that, and people do, but it's just cheaper to design connections that are tolerated. But that's all it is. So you can see here, the vertical adjustability is by that threaded rod. And uh, as it's sitting there, I could lower that. That floor slab could be an inch higher or an inch lower, and that would change nothing about the effectiveness of that panel connection. Totally adjustable. The in-out is by the distant connection. You see the beyond. Um, there I only could be out about another three-quarter inch, but that's actually not true because the toolbox has longer bolts in it. And those bolts are actually not bolted into the precast, they're in a slotted connection. So I could reach into the toolbox, pull out the six inch threaded rod, slap it in there, and still adjust even beyond larger. Now, you have to, in design, structurally, be sure that there are defined ranges of tolerances, because you don't want to go beyond the structural capacity of that. But it's very useful to design in a significant amount of tolerance, more than you think is needed, uh, and because it seems that more than you think is used. Um, and that's one critical part of this working, is that they have generous tolerances uh, for the dimensional variations of the building. Another critical innovation is the fact that they use two-stage sealant joints uh, between the precast panels. And that means that their joint is A, made out of a liquid sealant applied on the job site. The reason that is an advantage is that you can have a one quarter inch joint or a one inch joint and it will still work. Gaskets have limited ranges. And if you design it for half inch and compress it to a quarter inch, it might not work anymore. If you design it for half inch and the gap opens up to three quarters, it might not work anymore. Gaskets that have that range of adjustability tend to be quite expensive and difficult to install. So there are reasons why liquid sealants, caulking, aka caulking, uh, have real advantages. Because not only am I saying the variation could be a quarter inch to an inch, I'm not talking like on the joint, it could be that variation from the bottom of the joint to the 13 or 14 feet up to the joint above. And so you actually have to have a continuous variation of that tolerance. And so this in, in the end, it worked out that fluid like sealants uh, work. Now, the problem is, is that sealants exposed to the weather often are less than perfect. Either when they're installed, they don't actually get them to stick right everywhere, or over time, the sun and the temperature breaks them down. So that's why we have two layers of sealant on this drawing. There's the inside sealant protected from the sun and a lot of the extreme temperatures. That is actually the primary air and water continuity between the two panels, and then an exterior, which is a finish and a sunscreen and a rain screen. And that uh, has had a good track record of success. Um, is it possible to screw it up? Well, of course, it's possible. Everything's possible to screw up. All you just need is someone clever enough. Uh, but generally speaking, this is robust for the, the, the people that are building our buildings. Yeah. The system you're describing with the interior and the exterior joint, does that work in all geothermal regions? All Absolutely. We're, uh, Florida to uh, Fairbanks. And it's okay for the exterior seals to fail because it's sort of like your... It, it not only is it okay for the seal to fail, I mean, not that I would, I would advertise that to your sub-trades, um, but it's actually, you'll leave holes in this. You'll, you'll literally put holes in it. And in the last uh, section I was talking about, 
the way one inspects this is you go to the job site and you inject water past the outer seal and make sure that the water comes out at the weep holes. Like that's quality control. You can do that on 10% of panels affordably because it happens so fast. Um, and so you make sure that that's working. So you're not relying on the Sorry, you're not relying on the exterior for air seal continuity at all. Absolutely correct. Okay. The, the, it's the inner seal we're relying on for the air barrier and water barrier. Thanks. John, there's a question online. Uh, someone said, how did you get the sealant at the back? Yes. Um, well, I was, I, this is not a precast course, but hey, I love talking about precast. Uh, um, so basically, the, the inner seal is usually three inches behind the outer seal, and that is done because the tip of the caulking gun can reach back three inches. It's not just that, because you can get longer tips. It's just that you start beyond three inches, you can't really see what you're doing as much. And so about three inches, two and a half inches is where we target, both so it can be installed and tooled, because it's important that you're, you're tooling it uh, as, as well. Um, people have installed these uh, sealant beads as far as six inches back, but we, I'm generally not a fan of that. I like to see three inches so that I can see it uh, from the outside and make sure they've done it complete. And by the way, oh, just so you know, the reason, someone could have asked that, maybe they did it online. Uh, the reason we're installing these sealants from the outside is that if you install them from the inside, you have problems of continuity at floor slabs and behind columns. A ask me how I know, right? So literally my first precast experience was in 1989 on a project where I was running around chasing leaks for four months. Uh, because of the, the, the discontinuity as it went back by drop floor slabs. It worked at the 8-inch slab. They were able to just put caulking in from above and below, but wherever they had the return drop beam, where they had drop panels, where they had columns, another spot was they had fire uh, risers. Uh, and, you know, it's just so hard to do that, whereas on the outside, it's perfect. You know, some dude in a bosun's chair, it's just zip your way down. Um, I mentioned that we sometimes put sealant on the inside, many times put sealant on the inside, but it's temporary. It's just for waterproofing during construction. It's not really supposed to last a long time. From a long term, from a longevity point of view, by the way, um, if I use silicone seals, not polyurethane, I can easily get 25, 30 years life out of this. So what's my plan as say the, the federal government would ask me, GSA would say, so what's your plan for my courthouse if you're going to use this? Well, the plan is this. After 25 to 30 years, I have to remove the outer seal because it's exposed to UV and it'll start breaking down. I cut out that uh, old seal and I put in a new bead. After 50 to 60 years, the inner seal may, and I repeat may, need to be replaced. So what we're doing then is we cut the outer seal out and we actually caulk over the second layer of seal um, so that we don't have to remove it. We put another bead of sealant down there, and then we put the backer rod in, and we put the outer seal. And then at around year 75 to 90, we cut out the outer seal, put in another seal, and that gets me, I have a plan for the next century. Beyond that, I asked Scotty to beam me up a new sealant joint. <laughs> Some people may not know who Scotty are, practically the younger people online. <laughs> so glass fiber reinforced concrete panels are quite popular in California, particularly further south from here. Um, they use a steel frame, uh, often steel stud with uh, red iron, as they say, hot rolled steel, uh, to connect them to thin concrete. I hope you can capture the sense of thinness on these. And they are often only as thin as three quarter inches thick. Uh, to get away with making it that thick, they have a lot of glass fiber in it. That's what the GF stands for in glass fiber reinforced concrete. So they fire off the short lengths of glass with sand, cement, and water. And this is made literally by spraying into a form. It allows you to have more complex shapes. You can get some interesting and convincing. Many people probably see buildings like this and think they're concrete, or you might even go and, and go to Stanford and think that they're actually stone when they're actually GFRC. Um, so these work uh, in a way that's similar to precast, although they don't have as good a, a strategy for insulation as precast, tends to be a bit better. 
they're not as strong because they're thinner. Uh, they're not as moisture resistant because they're thinner. Uh, and uh, but that's why they're quite popular in drier parts of California, um, and they they totally can work, right? They're we know how they can work. They're are they're just closer to the edge. You have to be smarter about it, be more careful about it, have better quality control about it. Cross laminated timbers are popular. I, I guess this should be a review of successful systems. This is a new and emerging system. Um, and uh, it is, mo it is, however, just the structure, right? It, it doesn't, it isn't prefabricated in the terms of it doesn't provide a water barrier, an air barrier, uh, an exterior finish. Uh, it provides the support structure or the structure prefab. Um, but because people are excited and because RDH has done an awful lot of CLT buildings, um, uh, I thought I'd include it to say it is kind of fun. Uh, again making adjusting for tolerances and stuff when you're this size is, a, is, is quite important. One of the challenges with uh, CLT is that it's made out of wood. And uh, that means it expands and contracts with moisture. And so when you start getting panels the size what you see here uh, on the right hand side, um, and, and let's say it were to rain right now during that photograph. Um, I know it seems unlikely that your building might get rained on during construction. But uh, if it were to get rained on during construction, uh, that CLT will get wet. And you need to have a strategy for managing that. And we've found out what happens if you don't have a strategy. It, they, they swell. They store lots of water. You've got to be careful about it. You've got to be careful. It's a bit drier down here. It's probably better. I haven't done a CLT structure, but uh, talking to a structural engineer buddy of mine who's wanted to do one for a while, we've, and he's like, you got to seal up the end just like just like a door. You don't put the wood grain at the bottom. You got to just cover up the wood grain, and the rest of it's like if the surface gets wet, you're okay. But the end grains is what you got to cover on these. That's uh, true on the walls, but it's not true on the floors. On the floors, water uh, lands on it, and it runs the three inches or so to the left or the right, finds the hole between the two pieces of wood and runs in and enters a labyrinth of cracks and openings. So the walls are actually not that bad. It's the floors that we're always running into problems with. And, and it really, you'd think that, well, like wood is pretty good. It is actually, but the problem is all the joints between them and that lets the water between the joints and then it's stuck in the system and it's like, ah. <clears throat> so we've used uh, curtain walls, unitized in one form or another, for what, 40, 50 years? Um, so uh, th uh, do you recognize this building, do you think? Do you know, it's in Waterloo, Canada. Yeah, yeah, C6, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so um, this is a uh, unitized curtain wall system by Illumicor, uh, for anyone who cares. Um, you can see the panel sizes are, are actually relatively modest in size. See, precast panels, you can make quite large because they're built made of concrete. Aluminum, you can't, your sizes are limited because aluminum expands and contracts six times more per degree Fahrenheit than does concrete. And the joints between the panels in these unitized systems have to accommodate that expansion and contraction. Now, the horizontal joints have to expand, uh, accommodate the same amount of movement, whether they're precast or aluminum, because it's not temperature that's the movement, it's the sag of the slab. The sag of the slab in service is the, the dominating adjustability factor that you have to build in. Um, so we tend to see smaller panel sizes in unitized. Uh, they could be a bit bigger, but then they are limited. You see the crane they're using here. Uh, this is, again, a nod to don't use the main construction crane because that is dominating the construction schedule. So they're, they're able to use these small floor-by-floor -floor cranes um, that's a little uh, thing's called a spider on the right hand side, that red little crane. Uh, and it actually folds up, it lifts, it, it has little tracks and it rolls onto a normal elevator, fits through a normal elevator door. You can go up to the next floor, it rolls out and you can do the other. So that is a reason to keep the panel weights down, which results in the panel sizes being down. The challenge of these systems uh, is, well, just generally, they have terrible thermal performance and no solar control, right? So they're just, they just suck from that perspective. But if you're talking about a builder who's mostly worried about making a code-compliant building, um, the challenge are the joints. And there are lots of joints in the system, right? You can see every five-foot module width 
often they're five feet because, because that's the dimension used for system module furniture. And so you try and line them up with the modules on the, the aluminum mullions. So five foot modules are a very common dimension. Um, and uh, so they, they have a joint every five feet, the full height, floor by floor. So as I mentioned, with all prefabricated system, the joints require care and attention. And uh, this means you got a ton of joints. Uh, I, uh, how do I say this online? A manure load of joints. Um, so of course, uh, this stuff just clicks together like Lego. And uh, <laughs> there's various systems for this, but to, you know, again, like in the uh, precast concrete system, they have spent a fair bit of effort designing wonderful cladding connections. The cladding attachment details for uh, precast are way better than, they're way more polished than they are for, uh, for precast because they have a lot more money, right? So this is like a $100 a square foot system, and what I was showing was a $50 a square foot system, and so it's easy. Uh, to spend money on nice connections. Um, this is the head, or called the, the rooster head, uh, joint of a unitized curtain wall. The gray is the panel above. Uh, and so basically, these things slide together. Um, the, this also should show you that the air tightness of this panel is governed by those rubber gaskets, which are making the aluminum to aluminum connection. Like aluminum never touches aluminum, right? So there's r sliding rubber gaskets that accommodate maybe an eighth of an inch of dimensional variation in the panel, uh, which is why sometimes you have to hit them with a hammer. Uh, and the, the air tightness relies on that rubber being in contact with a certain amount of compression for the, for the life of the building. Uh, as they age, they tend to get more brittle, they tend to shrink, you tend to get a bit more leakage. They're not bad but they're not nearly as good as a cocked seal joint uh, because they're a moving rubber that will over time. Also, you'll notice that there's no uh, really good thermal resistance here. The aluminum transmits heat directly from outdoors to the indoors, uh, and that's one of the prices that people are willing to pay to make a uh, curtain wall, unitized curtain walls just go together pretty easily. Yes. I'm just wondering, is there a reason they don't uh, leave a channel for you to apply a cocked bead instead of using the rubber gasket? Well, two reasons. Uh, one is they don't want you to do caulking because that's another step on the job site that they're trying to avoid. And the other is, is that the way this is dying, you can't put in a cock joint because movement will rip the joint apart because it's a sliding joint, right? So, the, right, but you could reshape the extrusion to allow a joint, but they, they just, that's sort of like going backwards, right? They want to do everything and it just clicks together like Lego. You're not reading the manifesto. <laughs> so in real life, what happens at joints and penetrations is people slather all the transitions with pookie. Um, and uh, that is really, literally, if you look on shop drawings and stuff, there's like large blobs of sealant shown at corners and stuff. It's like, well, I don't know, we'll just smear it with some pookie. Um, and, you know, if you use good pookie, it could last 40, 50 years, though too much of a problem. But also I'd have to point out when someone asks me at the, the federal government and says, okay, so what's your plan at the, you know, for maintenance over the next century for my courthouse? It's like, nah, we don't got a plan. Uh, you know, it'll start leaking, it'll get worse and worse, and you'll rip it off and buy a new one. Um, so there, there really is a difference in lifespan that you get out of that. Did you have a question? No. Um, and there are these gaskets that uh, you saw a vertical uh, joint. This is a horizontal joint. Um, the blue line there is an exterior weather seal that's uh, being put in there. Um, it doesn't actually have to be uh, fully air and water tight because it's, there's a drainage space behind it. The red line there is an air seal that has to be airtight because you don't want air from inside that hollow tube, which is basically connected to the indoors, leaking outward into that space, condensing in cold weather or vice versa in warm weather. Um, this inside seal that I'm just indicating there uh, isn't that critical, because, but it's more of a, uh, an aesthetic thing. That inside seal is we, we know that there's going to be air in that tube because of all of the other transitions and penetrations going on in this typical uh, unitized curtain wall. Um, 
Here we're just, this one happens to have an aluminum fin sticking out of it, and the blue line matches up to the sealant on the blue line. Um, and it was demonstrated in the factory when we were doing our factory inspection is that you couldn't put the caulking in that gap. The gap wasn't large enough. Somebody had specified a 5 16 inch gap. We had a three inch aluminum fin and, you know, dude with caulking gun couldn't get there from here. And so those are the kinds of details you want to work out in prefab before it gets to the job site because you can't change it. Um, in this case, relatively small problem. You just hit upon a question that I, uh, something I've had arise on a project uh, on the very top arrow, that red arrow. Yeah. This is a conversation I've had with a general contractor. I want that joint sealed because because you, that one is going to eventually fail. If you've got two, wow. you have just a lower probability of failure over time. And right? that is one of the reasons why we do see two seals. But uh, we also know that the space between the two is almost always filled with uh, indoor air. And that's only because of the way we don't seal the vertical to horizontal connections uh, on these panels. We end up having a lot. Uh, we find when we look what's going on in here with pressure and, and humidity, it's almost always the same as it is out here. So I should spend a lot of political capital fighting that fight? Yeah, I would, I would spend your political capital making sure that's done and testing for it and not so much on that one. Yes. So yes, you Michael. meant on that one being the outer. The top one is less significant than the, the bottom red arrow. That's the one where, the, where we can get the most bang for buck. So metal panel systems, this is now low brow. Um, it's no big deal to get steel frame systems like this built. Uh, there's very little capital cost required. You're just moving the steel framing people from the site to some warehouse or tent. Uh, and uh, it's quite easy to pre-make panels. Uh, this one happens to be a company, this particular one is Lido Wall in Toronto. Um, they've uh, also um, sent out panels with full exterior cladding and insulation, but they're not as uh, often putting windows in. And again, the reason isn't a technical one, it's a coordination between different suppliers and getting along with each other. Um, but, you know, I think uh, one of the reasons that we see uh, some prefab companies doing better than others is that by bringing the, that window together to sell the whole solution is worth it. It really makes the, the general contractor's life easier, the, the architect's job easier, is that you're getting a complete solution. These are somewhat halfway. Another thing to notice about these is that they are open panel. This has some insulation in it, but not a lot. Um, this is none, this is uh, none. And when we talk about open panel, the reason is, is that many building occupancies, we need to run wires in the outside wall and security lines and maybe even land. There could still be people who don't use Wi-Fi. Um, anyway, uh, and that means you have to run the wires to the wall. And it is really annoying to connect power lines at panel joints. It's possible there are UL rated connectors but they cost more than leaving the drywall off and running the wire through, putting the drywall on, taping, and et cetera. Do you have a comment here? Sorry. This is where the Europeans are, are way ahead of us. The, the prefab folks in Europe and how they do the, even the, the sewer and the electrical connections, they have unitized connections the way the electrical industry does, you know, the consumer electronics industry does in this country. Well, we have them here. It's just that it's not, people don't want to spend the money. Now, we, if we were willing to spend the money that we spend on curtain walls, sorry, here, uh, we would absolutely be able to have connectors, but, they, but we won't. Like, that's a, that's a $100 a square foot plus solution. And we could. But what, how did the curtain wall with a $100 budget, how do they deal with electrical outlets in the outside wall? The, the, they're not in the wall. They're just, you put them in the floor or the ceiling, you know, take that, right? You figure it out. Um, and so that is possible, uh, although uh, it's just the reason that we have, we have investigated those connectors uh, on projects, and as soon as the GC checks the price out, they say, the hell with it. I'm not paying for that. One of the things the Europeans have an advantage of is that they have way less productive and more expensive trades. And that means that, oh, almost a, a lot of like expensive plugs make sense when you're paying a electrician $56 an hour and they don't, they, they're uh, doing eight plugs a day. 
Uh, and when you view it in a marketplace where you have more productive, less expensive trades, then it makes sense to do more on site, which is part of the reality as to why many of these systems exist in one place in one time and not in the other. Bill. Someone online is asking about uh, sill plate gasketing since they're saying that one uh, lesson they're taking away is that gaskets don't last. Well, uh, gaskets, uh, there's multiple types of gaskets. Um, the neoprene gasket that expands and contracts, you know, it lasts 20, 30 years as we would know from cars, yeah. right? The car door. Um, but it's when we, the building lifespan is, of course, at a different scale than airplanes and automobiles and refrigerators. And that's why I'm saying, what do we do at year 25 to 50? Uh, and so sill gaskets in houses um, are a kind of a more of a compression thing. They're not a very small neoprene kind of a gasket. So if you're talking about sill gaskets between concrete and wood, probably going to last. But that said, they're also not that fantastic at being air sealing sill gaskets because of the variations. And so if you're doing an airtight house, like a passive house or something, you're not relying on a sill gasket because you won't get tight enough. You're putting a bead of caulking in there or you're covering it up with a membrane. So sort of a different answer to the same sort of question. Yeah, this is just an, uh, this was a different manufacturer, different city. Uh, this is a photograph from 1998. Uh, so just pointing out, these are successful systems on the market. We've already had them. It's not like we have to invent prefab. Uh, we have multiple people building multiple systems. And so we know what the pros and cons are of those systems. Some of the newer things that are doing well in the market are things like prefabricated balconies. And so there's a number of motivators for this. One is that balconies are a fiddly bit that you could easily ship on a truck. Uh, and remove a lot of labor hours from the job site. But the other thing is, is that you can separate them from the primary building and thereby reduce the potential for water and air leaks at those penetrations. And then maybe the, the joists wouldn't rot off and you wouldn't pitch Berkeley students to their death in the streets. Um, and so this is uh, not just a San Francisco problem. Uh, rotting out at the penetration between the outdoors and indoors, whether it be steel, concrete, or wood, is common. Most of the time we get lucky and no one dies or even gets hurt. But there are, we are replacing concrete balconies in 1960 eras building in Chicago, New York, and Toronto by the thousands per year. There are contractors who do nothing but have standard billing rates for per linear foot of balcony, saw them off, fix it up, clip on new ones. Because it, you know, those are concrete ones, they take 50, 60 years to fail. Uh, wood ones take less. Um, so there is a market for both new to avoid the problem uh, and replacement to fix the problem. I had a... Uh, law of unintended consequences experience with this. I have a 173 unit senior living project in Napa that's under construction right now that we use these and we gen we, we looked at this very company. We ended up with somebody Elf. slightly closer. Yep. But of course, all these guys have their own system of how they do things, all these connections. I mean, they got it down to a freaking science. And of course, after they, this client didn't, you know, screwed with their general contractor around, GC changed twice. They decided to do a different system. Now, I've long since left this firm, but now, there's, now I'm, I'm hearing from my same structural engineer buddy who's still on this project about, oh, my God, this is a nightmare now because it's a different system, different contractor. All the connections were detailed. Now they we're have, changing it all. And they are just flying by the seat of their pants in Napa right now. Yeah. Uh, well, trails, uh, tales from the trenches of how things really happen. It didn't click together like Lego is what you're saying, Michael. <laughs> Um, modular. Okay, let's talk about modular now. Uh, modular is, um, is, is, is really good when it uh, is really good. Uh, and so the, the thing we have to think about is we need to ship air. We need to have limited uh, dimensions of spaces is one of the places where modular fits better. So for example, if you're trying to make a 40 by 40 foot ballroom, modular might not be a good answer for you. Uh, whereas if you're trying to make a, uh, a motel, a hotel, a dormitory residence, a prison, um, where the scale of the, the short dimension of the room is in the nine to 
16 foot range. Wow, you know, that might be quite useful because you get repetitive units and the scale is within the width that you can put on a truck and ship. And so there are some of these types of buildings where in occupancies where you go, yeah, that makes sense. You know, and some buildings were actually mixing it. You end up, uh, as we have with wood uh, buildings over concrete podiums, well, we end up with modular over top of a podium that has long spans. So hotels, for example. So you have an open space with a conference center, the big restaurant uh, attached, and even the atrium. But then the, the guest suites are just made to be out of modular, especially in smaller uh, hotels with smaller rooms. Uh, and that usually means hotels in expensive cities. And that means that they usually are have the money, if it's an expensive city, to pay for modular. Uh, not that modular is cheaper, but modular is faster, lower risk, more reliable, and you can really make that click. Um, so, um, you know, various examples of modular that work, uh, multifamily uh, is, a, is a classic one, like I said, dorms. But when we think about modular versus panel systems, so if I put a panel down, as I mentioned with CLT, if I have a panelized floor, when I take it off the truck, we have to be ready for it to be rained on. And so that limits my ability to have pre-finished floors. Also, we have people now need to stand on that uh, modular panel to erect the walls. And uh, construction workers rarely wear you know, fuzzy bottom shoes while they're running around in the rain erecting panels. So it limits how much finishing we can do on the tops of these panels. Um, I then put up my wall panel, uh, and then if I stack another floor panel on top, it's telling me that under this stage, the inside of my panel is gonna get wet. One of the things about precast concrete being successful and uh, curtain, curtain walls and steel panels with exterior gypsum board they're all able to get wet during construction without any disadvantage. And so that's why they're successful. That's why they're practical. They're actually being successful in the marketplace because they deal with that. So when you're coming up with new or evaluating new systems, it's like, keep in mind, uh, be cynical. It's going to get rained on. Not every panel, every time, but every project, you're going to get rain on it when you least expect it because that's how Murphy works. Um, okay, so now if I were to have, a, uh, to, have to do interior partitions, uh, they have to come afterwards. That's another thing to consider. Are there non-load bearing movable partitions? Are they installed before you put the lid on or are they just erected on site? Many times they just choose to build them on site because by the way, steel stud partition walls are dirt cheap. You know, like it's like $4 a square foot for a uh, three and a half inch steel stud with uh, gypsum board on either side. It's just not worth it. Um, and it goes back to real life prefab stuff that will really make a difference in terms of price and schedule. Uh, and that's how you tend to prioritize these things. Um, now, when I'm doing a box, like a modular box, guess what? I could actually water, make the box relatively water and airtight. And that means I can actually finish the inside up into and including a painted gypsum wall board with carpet on the floor. Totally doable. Now, a couple of things, consequences of that. Great advantage, I'm just shipping air, but you've added so much value, it may be worth it. Um, however, notice how I have the floor and the ceiling, I have like, well, they're not the same thing. In most buildings, the floor and the ceiling are the same thing. Not in modular, you gotta have a top, if you're going to do water resistant and you got to have a floor of the unit above. So that's one reason why it costs more money. You're buying a redundant ceiling or a redundant floor. You pick. Um, you're also buying redundant water resistance. So that roof of the top of the bottom panel there or both modules has to be water resistant. So that costs a bit of money. So uh, can you save money on modular? Sure. By some efficiencies in the, in the, in the factory, and, and repetition and stuff, you can, but you're also, there are things that are costing you money, like making them water resistant, uh, redundant floors, and shipping and designing around shipping. That costs money. So uh, with the joints, as I've mentioned, it's a key issue in prefab. And when I 
uh, have described, you know, the building enclosure. Uh, you can look on other uh, presentations we've given on this topic. So we have our control layers. We have our structural support, exterior and interior finish, and we have our thermal air, water, vapor control, sometimes fire control, sometimes sound control. The job in a prefab joint is connect those. And uh, how do I connect those? Uh, how, one of the, the things that annoys people about economical modular buildings, like say site trailers, if you go to construction site trailers, you can see the joints between the drywall, right? Because they got like a plastic strip over them. So how are you making that joint in a way that's aesthetically acceptable while still accommodating movements? Uh, does that joint on the inside have to also fire protect the structure behind like it does if you have a steel frame system? So this is like, this is real life. Like when you start having to finish these buildings, it's like, oh, and then you can see why I show the open panel system being the most successful in steel stud. It's like, okay, we'll just line it all up with drywall and mud it and not have to worry about all those details. Now in Europe or Japan where they have the, the full prefab with the plug together connectors, you can see the joints and I go, oh, nice ATCO trailer you got here. Not what the tour guide usually likes to hear. But usually they don't know what an ATCO trailer is, so it's just a joke for us. It's I don't know if all of you know what an echo trailer is. Um, anyway, uh, so now when I do the outside, uh, somebody's got to connect the air, water, vapor control layers. Might be one product, but you've got to get your hands in to finish it. Some of the question online was, how do you get that cock joint in three inches? Can you imagine the effort of trying to seal and lap an air and water barrier that might be five or six inches in? Uh, like, we're, you know, so you not start having to leave chunks of the cladding out and chunks of the insulation out so you can access that critical joint to make the connection. Now, many people say, oh, that's a lot of work. I'll, I'll try and avoid it. I'll just spray foam in there or I'll spray faith and magic uh, or something. Uh, that's why we end up with these failures is that, no, you can't make any shortcuts at this time. You really have to push your way through this. So uh, allow room for lapping, uh, complete the seal near the exterior. This is how they do it, say, in precast, as we pull that air and water barrier out more towards the outside and then seal it. We've done that with a lot of uh, these metal panel systems as well. We make sure that the air barrier and water barrier is wrapped outward at the joint so it can be reached by a sealant joint or with a minimum of exterior connections. So I'm going to do a couple case studies. I'm going to start with a very local case study uh, um, with a somewhat unhappy ending. Uh, wood frame modular. And again, this was in the time when modular is cheaper, faster, greener, easier. It just clicks together like Lego. So we built the, you know, it's an established manufacturer, built these uh, modules, finished the inside with uh, cabinetry and paint and finish flooring, right? So they're, we're going to taking full advantage of modular performance. Now, here it is being craned into place. Um, now, you might notice that that's OSB, and there are openings in it. And you might also notice that there are storm clouds overhead. Um, so what would happen if it rained during this assembly process? Probably nothing good. Well, it rained during this assembly process and nothing good happened. Now, uh, another thing that happens is that prefab assembly lines can move quite quickly and often faster than they can install them. So you have to have a place of storing them at the factory or at the job site, and you gotta be sure that those are safe places for vandalism, fire, and uh, water. <laughs> and so the solution here was, well, let's get some like four mil plastic poly and strap it out over top. Now, there should be a hint at this picture, if you look closely, that there might be a problem. This module is not expecting. The bulge in that plastic is due to the fact that it is filling up with water. Uh, and that's because of just somebody lapped the plastic on top and the water went sideways underneath. And, and you know, a third of these modules were filled with water at the end of the rain. 
Um, now, of course, the buildings that they had started, did they waterproof the top of the units in the factory? No, because we live in a dry climate. This isn't going to happen. So as it begins to rain, they quickly go to the local builder supply yard and buy a bunch of blue tarps, which then promptly blow away. So then they go back to the builder supply yard, buy a bunch of sandbags to put it on top to ensure that the water ponds and leaks through it all the laps. Now, we can laugh at this because it wasn't our millions of dollars. <laughs> but it is amazing at how it is possible for someone to do modular building and not be aware of the realities it's going to rain during construction. People want so much to make it cheaper that they make it fail. These things, I think, should cost more per square foot, and that will make them succeed, and then people will want to build them. But there's too many stories like this of too many developers who got went modular, and it turned into these types of disasters. So we got videos of this stuff, too, of watching the ceiling cave in and listening to the contractor swearing. It's great. Um, so water tightness has got to be a priority from the yard to the during assembly stage. Um, and transport can sometimes be the most critical because you're driving down the highway at 65 miles per hour during a rainstorm. That's more extreme than most rain penetration tests are done. Uh, and if you're relying on a piece of polyethylene that's stapled to the side as your water control layer, you will fail. Uh, we need much better. Uh, this is not something to scrimp on. Um, and this project also had all kinds of join line problems, uh, expansion and contraction with moisture, twisting during construction. That all meant that the joints that were designed with, as far as we can tell, half an inch or less tolerance, just either were butting up to each other or people were using chainsaws to chop off edges to try and make them fit together. Um, and so, you know, a lot of things that could be done wrong were done wrong. And, and no money or time was saved. Let me just tell you that. No money or time was saved. Um, here's another, just, just on, on the joints thing. This is a, uh, a North American-wide prefabricated builder. Uh, and this is the join line between two steel joints. Um, so somebody has used that uh, red tape to air seal the connection. But the join line is also through that metal. And the metal, look, it's perfect, right? That, jo that leaks a lot of air. And that's what uh, your average contractor looks and says, look, uh, I put these two C channels together and they're touching. How could they leak? Because they're not touching everywhere. So the reason we were there was this is a cold climate and water was coming out of the joint. And of course, this is like they you know, had a, hired the, told the roofer to come back hire a roofing specialist and everyone said, oh, roof's not leaking. Well, it must be leaking because water's coming through the thing. So then they call the expert from far away, right? So, oh, okay, so we have to go and find out why the roof leaks when the roof is perfect. And of course, it doesn't take more than 10 seconds to figure out that air is leaking through the joint, condensing on the cold side, dripping back. And so that's why the roof is leaking. Um, so even steel to steel joints that look tight are not, that's not water or airtight. You gotta have membranes that cover them up. And ideally I would have actually put a gap in the design and said, nope, it's a three quarter inch gap. And maybe it narrows down to a quarter. Maybe it goes up to an inch and we have a solution that seals that and accommodates that. Quick question. Someone asked how much those modules weighed. Ooh, I don't know how much yeah. those modules weigh, I mean, but the, we're, we're typically a small module will be in the two ton land yeah, and yeah. big modules will be in the six to eight ton module land. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty, that's, I'm telling you that range because uh, you want them big, but if you make them too big, the crane starts to be too much of a problem. Yeah. I mean, right. The crane there had three steel beams or multiple steel beams to, to, to be prepare. able to handle yeah. it. Yeah. So, Here's a case study on the other side. Uh, so here we are uh, in northern Canada. So uh, this is a module that you can't drive there because there's no roads. And so there's also no, there's actually not even a dock. So you actually have to unload the module, put it onto a barge, drag the barge onto the shore with large uh, uh, bulldozers, uh, and then lift them off the, from the shore, drive them to town and assemble. So we're doing a five-story hotel conference center um, in, in a place where they have 14, no, 18,000 heating degree days. Um, so that's, that's cold 
for people who uh, don't know what heating ingredients are like. Um, and so lots of insulation was needed. This is a steel system. Uh, it's modular. They also ship from their factory in uh, China with uh, full furniture, uh, including rolling chairs. They got techniques for bunging the rolly rolling chairs uh, into the, uh, the desks and stuff so that as they transport them halfway around the world, uh, they show up with chairs that are unscuffed. Uh, they have neat uh, I, they have literally like, uh, you know, hotel art that shows up in all hotels. They have ways of attaching hotel art to the walls so that you can ship it across the world without the hotel art falling off. Um, so they, you know, this has been a hard won experience. Um, so this is actually a picture of their uh, factory. Uh, you can see the lids, uh, the corrugated metal roofing. Uh, where they, they are using basically the same steel that they use on shipping containers, uh, very much similar idea. Um, one of the things about that roof is that that's their waterproofing, right? It is actually almost an eight inch steel core 10 welded at all joints. And so, okay, they got a roof that, that doesn't leak. We like that. Uh, all we have to worry about are some of the joint details. Infill, it happens to be steel stud, then it's wrapped, uh, well, it's wrapped with gypsum board, insulation, uh, and cladding. I'll show you some more pictures. But one of the things being is that it leaves the factory and it gets stored in the yard. These are heavy-duty polyethylene shrink wraps. This is the stuff you use to store your boat over the season. Uh, so it, it's, it's not like four or six mil poly. This stuff is really heavy-duty, and they shrink wrap it over the whole thing. You'll notice in the upper corners, upper left and upper right corners, see the blue circles there? Uh, that tells the people who are going to lift this out of the yard where the connection points are for the crane. And so the way they lift this from the yard onto the truck on the way to the ship is they cut a hole in the plastic, they attach the crane. When it goes onto the truck, they tape a plastic back over the hole. It gets to the, to the, uh, the dock side, they remove the plastic, they lift it onto the ship, they tape it back on. Yep, that's the annoying, what you have to do. Every move, undo the plastic, put it back again. Undo the plastic, put it back again, or it won't be watertight. Here it is going from the truck up onto the ship. Here it is going from the ship onto the truck. Actually, this is here from the truck. It's already gone off the ship. Now it's sitting, uh, going onto site. And see the red tape? where after several moves, there's lots of tape that is being used to hold uh, cracks and joints together. Now, here they are lifting it. They removed the plastic wrap because they're about to crane it on top of another one. Notice the opening. And uh, so if it were to rain right now, they would be screwed, right? Everyone gets that, the interior would totally get wet. So, um, I don't like this, but it's okay. You know, they're big boys. They can take some risks. But they have a, poly they have a, a plan in place for when they remove that plastic, meaning literally 15, 20 minutes before they do the lift, they're removing the plastic over those openings. And when that thing comes down, they have a plan for covering it up with plastic in another 15 or 20 minutes. That's kind of like you got to lay out a plan for how you're going to deal with this, how you're going to connect to the joints, when do you open and close thing, how long are you open to weather. Um, this, by the way, are, uh, is actually not a, a water type opening as well, um, but uh, this was early. We, were just get, we got involved with this company at this stage and we identified some of the things that were risky. They identified some of the things that had caused them problems and they had an amazing overlap, actually. We said, this, this, this could go wrong. And they said, you know, that, that, that has gone wrong. <laughs> and so uh, come up with solutions. This is when uh, module A on the left is connected to module B on the right. Uh, the, the green circle at the left, where you see the plumbing stack going through, that is actually kept watertight by a metal plate that's welded to that top deck. So at the photo, you could look and say, I, I'm, I'm a bit worried about that. And they're going, yep, yeah, we know, serious problem, but we've solved it by welding that steel plate flat. Uh, and it's totally watertight. Good. Um, the joint in the middle, the, the, the pale green line in the middle with the circular joint, a circular spot, that's a major leak. 
because if it rains at this moment, and you can see, can you see the water standing on some of the, yeah. <laughs> if it were to rain at this moment, some of the water would run to the right and some would run to the left. In this photograph, the water from the right module running left would leak into this unit. So now they have a plan. When that unit gets set down, first thing is they connect it structurally, that there's a, you know, bolts to put in, and then immediately people are going up and sealing that joint to make that metal roof continuous and watertight so that it can rain and it won't get into the module. And it's about knowing that that is a critical feature and, and having someone who has the right to stop this installation method during construction if rain looks like it's going to happen in the next 15, 20 minutes. And you can, by the way, get away with a few drizzles and stuff like that. So it's pretty robust, but it's having a real plan. And they have it written down. And they talk to the trades and the installation people. They know ahead of time. We have helped them define what materials to use at that joint. What do you use when you have to stick to frozen steel? What do you use when you stick to wet steel? And so you have to have different sealants and um, tapes. So for example, there are tapes that you can install underwater that will stick to steel. So that means they'll stick to wet steel. So, but that's identified part numbers. This is what you use. Online has just made the comment that there's a substantial plastic use, and is the, can the plastic be recycled, or does it wind up in landfill? Uh, there is substantial plastic use. There's also a substantial steel use. And how about diesel fuel use? As we truck this stuff halfway across the freaking planet, so I am pretty sure that that quantity of plastic does end up in recycling. It's because uh, it's like uh, enough of a quantity it's worth loading up a ten-ton truck with. But I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. And in that northern project, that will be more of an issue uh, where they don't have recycling facilities. So this is a vertical section through a joint between the a module above and module below. Note the redundant floor ceiling systems. That's just the cost of doing business in module, modular if you want to reliably solve the weather problem. The blue membrane is the air-water barrier that wraps right around the edge of the module. Um, and so that helps water and air proof the thing while you're shipping. The red line is the tape that is applied over top of that joint, typically a four inch, but you can buy them in six as well, that tapes the joint together. The pale blue oval is a backer rod so that the tape gets some physical support. And the green line is the tape that goes over the tape. Um, and so that's because when you apply a tape in this format, if you have any wrinkles in the tape, it can act as a, a funnel for collecting rainwater and drive it into that. So I can't prove that theoretically. I can only tell you we know this is a widespread problem, and that's why we have the green tape on top. And that tends to be a thinner tape, less prone to fish melting. It, and when you have the two layers, it's, you know, belt suspenders, clean underwear, you're good. Um, we've also worked on uh, modular uh, concepts for, uh, in this case, 24 stories. Um, but um, the economics start to be a real problem. Uh, those redundant floors and, and uh, the floor to ceiling heights that that costs you starts to be more and more significant. Um, so I'm not uh, that optimistic that 24 stories is going to make sense. You know, in the 10 to 12 story range, this type of system, literally this company that I was just showing you, totally can do a 10 to 12 story building. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense. But uh, as we get to larger and taller buildings, we'll often be a, need to have a structural core to brace us and to get the higher fire, hour, fire ratings needed to get emergency access. And so I'm showing on the right, you know, a slip form concrete core, easy to do three days of floor. You can probably do a little faster. Um, and then when the modules come up, we worked out a sequence of events of what do you seal in what order. And the last thing you seal, by the way, is the walls because they're just at so much less risk than the horizontals. A little bit of rain does not accumulate and try and get into your unit. Uh, but a little bit of rain on your top of your module accumulates and concentrates at low spots and causes you problems. 
So sealing to the concrete core, sealing the joints to joints, turning that into a temporary roof, and then the next floor goes on top. Uh, with these systems, we also have to worry more about uh, tie-offs. This is increasingly an issue about where are we going to have the tie-off for the trades to be able to have their follow rest system attached. That tie-off shouldn't be a hole through your air-water barrier. Um, and there's even you know, things like uh, assessing, so what's going on with your fire control during construction, during storage? There's, a, you know, like most buildings, there's a lot of things to think about. And I guess that's my, my overriding message here is that there's nothing like prefab is a, a great viable alternative. But to think that it's simple and that it's easy is to get yourself in trouble. Go to it knowing it's worthwhile, but it's not easy. You got to think through the details, be a little bit cynical, or at least learn from, your, uh, from other people's mistakes. Um, this is another local uh, project of well, 10 years ago now, Bill, I can hardly believe it. Uh, this was a, um, a net zero, uh, all the, this is a company that was going to be net zero energy, modular homes, they cracked the code, it's going to be cheaper, faster, easier. Um, and they did build a net zero home. Um, and so this is the uh, factory where they're building wood frame um, assembly insulated pretty well, of course, had exterior insulation, continuous insulation to get to higher performance, had a very good air barrier that was tested in the factory and then subsequently in the field. And even then we weren't that happy with it. Uh, meaning I think it was still ended up at like three air changes per hour, 2.7, which would be pretty horrible, frankly, but it's harder in prefab with people don't um, have a lot of experience. So there's our house wrap. Um, here, the module is being lifted into place in Oakland. Notice the uh, top is open, and there's not, that's because there's not a lot of interior finishes being done. And you, you, because if you, it's just a few pieces of wood there to stop them falling apart, but it does, it's a choice you make. Do I do a lot of finishes and pay the extra cost for, the, for redundant lid, or do I not get the exterior fin interior finishes and leave the lid. Those are, the, those are important path decisions to make. Um, so as you can see, the precisely dimensioned uh, modular manufactured house fit perfectly on the precisely dimensioned concrete foundation. It's just one was zigging while the other was zagging. Um, and there's, you know, this is not something we could fix with a chainsaw or a come along. It was just something we had to buy some additional flashing, and like the time-honored tradition in architecture everywhere, plant shrubs uh, so that you couldn't see it. Uh, <laughs> the end result of this four-module unit uh, actually was architecturally quite interesting and pleasing, um, and certainly uh, it, it worked quite well. Um, the interior looked like a modern, totally ready-to-move-in house, uh, we monitor, we measured the air tightness, measured the mechanical performance on an hourly basis. Um, we installed it originally at 4 kWs of PV, but because it's Oakland and we don't really have any weather, uh, we didn't need 4 kW. But we, we, uh, we installed 4 kW to be sure that we got to net zero. But because of the net zero rules, there was no benefit for producing more electricity. And so uh, they ended up removing about 400 watts of PV so as to not donate free power. Uh, but it turns out, so this is actually was being operated at more like a 3.6 kW PV house. Uh, and in terms of technology, I mean, really what it was, was we built it to the 2006 Iowa building code. Uh, you know, you know, three air changes an hour at 50, an inch of continuous foam insulation on the outside of two by six. The really the, the most significant upgrade in this house was that we used triple glazed fiberglass windows. Um, and we, yeah, we used a two ton Goodman heat pump air conditioner. Uh, that was it. Uh, you know, there's really nothing magic here. It's just building like as if it were a cold climate, build it in Oakland and you use almost no energy. The Zeta factory you just showed us a photo. Is that the same factory that, after they went under, became Blue Homes and has since been bought out by David Baker and a whole variety yes. of other Yes, so it's gone through folks? numbers of cycles, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Um, where was I here? Right. So the last uh, case study I'll show uh, 
is this uh, passive house, uh, residential housing. Again, it's a bit remote. And let me just explain why a couple of these are remote. And that is because this makes, this pays for modular. Uh, You don't have access to uh, a trained workforce at a reasonable rate. You don't have access to materials and systems for stuff that you may have forgotten and need to bring to site. You don't have a long uh, construction cycle. These are all reasons that are screaming prefab, 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 right? Um, the reason that we see interest in places like San Francisco, downtown New York, etc., is that in many ways they're the same, in that you don't have access to a lot of people because it's hard to get downtown and the people who show up are quite expensive, etc. So it's a similar driver. If you try and do some of this stuff in, I don't know, in Salinas, Kansas, you'll, you have no hope because site built construction is so inexpensive. I think I said yesterday, I think it costs as much to permit a building in, in, the, in Oakland as it does to build one in Salinas, Kansas. Um, so, <laughs> so uh, this, is a, uh, this is Bella Bella. For those of you who don't know who Bella Bella is, it's, uh, it's very nice because it rains a lot and grows lots of trees. Uh, it's very far away, so it has great nature, uh, but it means that it's challenging to get housing. And the housing they build has to be top notch in terms of water control because it rains a lot and it gets cold in the winter. So it also has to be pretty good at insulation and stopping condensation. So there's some, you know, you just need to do some good stuff here. The existing buildings weren't up to snuff uh, and uh, they were routinely getting to major repairs to condemnation in the five to 15 year uh, range. Um, it was, you know, very common that 20 year old houses were totally demolished, just couldn't, uh, just rotting, couldn't be fixed. Uh, and so, um, th- this was a first nations, uh, project where they're saying enough, if we're going to spend money on housing, we're going to get her done once and get her done right. And so this is one of those examples, right? You know, pay 10 or 15% more and actually get what you want to, as opposed to save 10 or 15% and get nothing. So this was the, the project, uh, you can see it's somewhat passive house inspired, and that is a completely rectangular box. Uh, and that does, uh, <laughs> but they tried to make it, I think succeeded in making a little bit of a respect for the First Nations in terms of the, the posts that look a bit more like totem poles, the colors that reflected a bit of the colors on those totem poles. Uh, but really the, the big deal was that it was going to work. This was gonna be affordable to heat and cool, and it was gonna be healthy and durable. So uh, this is the uh, prefabrication line. Again, many of these modular, we're doing sort of like mass customization, right? We're not building a thousand of these. We're not even building a hundred of these. We're building like eight of these. So you, you only get a certain amount of that industrialization, but then you're more likely to get a unique building. Um, so this is the air water barrier. You can see that we're using pressure treated uh, wood around the window because of the climate being so wet and so uh, so conducive to rot. Um, we're uh, on the outside of this comes six inches of stonewall insulation. There's a two by six with six inches of the bat and six inches of stonewall on the outside. Um, and this is some of the stages, drawing sets for prefab. Like I said, you need a plan for transportation instruction. You need drawings for transportation. You need drawings for assembly because you can't just show the finished product. You got to say, this is what we're building in the factory. And then when it gets to the job site, this is what you're doing during installation. And then you get, and this is what it looks like at the end. Um, And of course you don't have to do that everywhere, but you certainly have to do it at the joints. It's all about the joints. It's like Canadian politics these days. It's all about the joints. Uh, anyway, uh, so this shows the factory and transport versus on site. This was one of those where we had to leave that plug of six inches out so that humans could get their hands in, right? We couldn't get the people at Foxconn to come over and put the piece of tape in in a three quarter inch joint. So we opened up the joint so that uh, you could actually get normal people's hands in there. Um, this is, for example, the way it left the factory. The reason for that three quarter by six inch continuous plate on the lower module, left side of the lower module, um, is because of dimensional tolerances. You can't have the flat ceiling sit on the flat roof because neither of them are flat except in the drawing. They actually have variations. 
And so you're making a deliberate high point that you know stuff will sit on. And even it doesn't actually touch continuously on that plate either, right? There's little variations, but it, at least most of the rocking and wiggliness is solved. And then on the job site, uh, it's easy to put wood shims in there to adjust the last quarter inch of variation out. And it doesn't change the performance because you see you have an air water barrier all the way around the wood structure, ceiling and floor. So uh, lessons were learned during this, um, but this is just showing the plug that was put in uh, and uh, the three quarter inch continuous plywood blocking was installed. And one of the nice things about that is that you can also, how hard is it do you think to take to site five eighths inch continuous blocking or half inch continuous blocking? That's why plywood's much better for this, right? You can get it in its various thicknesses. Much like I find good window installers have their their uh, box full of various, different various shims for different sizes. So, oh, three quarters doesn't work? Here, let's use the five eighths and be able to work. Um, whether we would do that again or not, I don't know. Part of the reason for that was to make the structural engineer happy. In many ways, I would have preferred to use discrete shims every so many feet and then just use a bead of caulking in there. Uh, it's a little bit easier. Um, here we see the uh, units being, so they were built in the lower mainland, put onto a barge, go up the, uh, uh, the inlet between Vancouver Island and British Columbia, up to Bella Bella, uh, drove off the barge onto the dock. You can see what we call a dock in remote areas, but at least we didn't have to use a bulldozer to pull the thing out. Um, being installed, you can see the air water barrier, the plywood on the, on the left side, and you look at the three modules that already have been set is there to protect the the windows from getting busted by, uh, you know, random flying ropes and chains and stuff from being on a barge. Um, so uh, one of the things they say we learned, they tried to avoid putting a hole, tried to turn the OSB into a water and air barrier. It totally worked, but it got uh, rainy enough that the OSB got quite wet. And so we would much, and it didn't cause any leaks or damage inside, but it caused consternation. Uh, and so, uh, again, we would say, guys, look, it's just an extra 40 cents a square foot. Roll that whole roof with membrane. Now, maybe you can avoid that in some climates and construction sites. This is a rainy place. Um, join lines at the vertical joints. Um, you can see uh, the OSHA approved step ladder installation techniques being used at the right. Um, <laughs> and so uh, the lessons we learned here is that both modular construction and passive house is a team sport. We need to involve more people and we need to involve them earlier and we need to involve them in a more meaningful way of asking not just what the finished product is, what is going on in the whole process from factory to transport to sitting on the site to being installed to being finished. There are multiple phases in life now that we have to talk about. Um, so really getting great details to accommodate tolerances, sequences, and ensure control continuity is how we make sure they work. Um, Mock-ups uh, are, are your friend. Figure it out. One of the benefits of prefab, and this goes for site construction too, but you're crazy if you don't do it in prefab, is mock it up, spray water at it, ask the trades what they think about the buildability, try something out, do a prototype. Uh, don't make your first uh, product be something that you're going to ship to site. And then protect against rain during red, red yard transport, transportation construction. All right, I'm going to uh, take, I think I have to quit now, right, Bill? I'm surprised you're not like jumping up and down. Yeah, well, yeah, I, you, you only have a couple more yeah, slides. Yeah, I only have a couple so more slides. Why don't you just keep going? All right, well, um, we expect more wood prefabricated panels, more modular construction for all the reasons I said earlier in the presentation. Um, and I have to say, I think it's, uh, it's nice to see in the last 10 years that larger proportions of modular manufacturers are taking it seriously, are acknowledging that it's harder. Uh, where it used to be everyone just said, oh, it's easy. And then they had a lot of problems. Uh, as people get more experience, they're being more honest about it. And like, I would just say, don't expect it to be cheaper, just expect it to be better. Um, and uh, for example, uh, sometimes uh, insulated concrete forms is an interesting technology that's been around North America for 25 years. Not a prefab construction, but it could be. 
and is being. So there's at least, this is one guy I know who's taken it the furthest in New York area. They're prefabbing all the walls out of ICF, putting rebar in it, and then in a factory, in a warehouse, and then shipping it to the rebars made, shipped to the job site. Now, they've got like a dozen panels, wall panels on that, tra on that trailer that is being pulled by a three-quarter or one-ton pickup truck. Um, easy to lift into site. Your panel size is all volume limited. You can use lightweight cranes, and then you, you know, stack them up and pour concrete in it. Um, so uh, that's just showing that there are new ideas, even with old materials, that we can accelerate construction schedules, get some benefits. Uh, of prefabrication, uh, and they're often not going to be the complete modular solution with the kitchen cabinets hanging on the wall. There's a lot of value in things like just doing plumbing trees, making sh doing the ICF ahead of time. There's a lot of stuff that we can do to accelerate schedule and improve quality and make labor happy, because uh, that's not a, a small thing, keeping labor happy uh, so that we keep getting it. Prefab is a century-long uh, trend. Slow and steady improvements. There are numerous practical benefits uh, to be dealt with, but we're, that means we're going to see a lot more of this stuff. Um, and uh, it's hopefully we're going to go forward more informed, learn from the past, see what we need for the future, and pick our projects wisely where it makes economic and project sense to do uh, either panelized or modular or something in between. Okay, I'm done. We have some online questions. Do we have offline questions? Yeah, we'll, we'll take a couple of questions in the room. How, how does this apply to residential? Well, most of what you've seen are residential projects. So, I mean, custom, like a custom home. Oh, I see. With custom home, mostly, I would say, it, it, mostly we're talking modular. It's a solved problem. If you want a prefab uh, modular home, call a modular home manufacturer. That, that's like I'd say, I think that's mostly a solved problem. And one other thing, because uh, it's an interesting way you started out with um, non individualized identity to many things like windows, prefab. Yep. Uh, I was almost thinking like clothing, though that's a little bit, but why do you think, why housing? Why do people want unique housing? Yeah. Kind of Man, you know, I'm an engineer who play uh, at an architecture school. That's a very deep question. I think it's a meaningful one, but I don't know the answer. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else in the room? Okay, we got a one or two online. So um, one person asked if you know where there is um, cost data on prefabs or modulars? <laughs> um, there's lots of, um, I wouldn't call it data. There's lots of people say things cost stuff, but really it's actually quite difficult to get precise cost data on any building construction because it's too dependent on time and place. Um, so, I mean, you can get rough numbers, but, like, you know, if you're asking me, uh, okay, if I want a modular home, well, if you want a good one, it's like 250, 300 bucks a square foot. Can you, you can get them down to 200 bucks a square foot, but then you start scrimping on, uh, on quality or you're in an area where everything is less expensive. Um, you know, you're not going to get it for 120 bucks a square foot, right? That can, I mean, we can be that general. Uh, but it's very difficult to be more general, and I think it's disingenuous to pretend we can be more precise because site and time, I mean, that's why we have tenders all the time, right? We, have con we send out uh, bids to a whole bunch of contractors, and we get prices that vary plus or minus 15%. If, we, if there was actually a cost for a thing, why would we bother with tenders? It's because the cost depends on how many people are available, whether they think they can get it done better or not. Did someone do a math mistake? That's how you become a little bitter. Okay. All right. With that, I think we're a few minutes over. So uh, thank you, John. Thank you to everyone uh, yeah. online. And I will get, uh, we will be getting a link out to folks. Uh, give yeah, me a you'll get this days. the PDF. Yeah, so you'll get a PDF of this. So with that, thank you to everyone.